on WealthTrack, the bullish case for stocks. That's why I'm kind of looking at the 2020s and thinking, maybe it'll be the roaring 2020s. Uh, we had a technological boom in the 1920s. I think we're gonna have a technology-led boom uh, in the 2020s. Influential economist and strategist Edgar Denny presents his evidence on Consuelo Mac Wealth Track. Funding provided by Clearbridge Investments, Morgan Le Fay Dreams Foundation, First Eagle Investment Management, Royce Investment Partners, Matthews Asia, and Strategus Asset Management. Hello and welcome to this edition of Wealth Track. I'm Consuelo Mack. Yankee legend Yogi Berra famously said, it's deja vu all over again, one of his many memorable expressions. Well, that's the way I feel this week. The deja vu all over again is the theme of don't fight the Fed. The Federal Reserve's recent pivot from inflation promoter to inflation fighter puts that adage front and center in the current debate between the bulls and the bears. In his 1970 investment classic, Winning on Wall Street, author Martin Zweig, who coined the don't fight the Fed phrase, wrote, the monetary climate, primarily the trend in interest rates and Federal Reserve policy, is the dominant factor in determining the stock market's major direction. Well, this week's guest has been following that dictum during his 40-year investment career. He has been bullish since the Fed opened the monetary spigots in 2009. He is Ed Yardeni, a PhD economist, longtime Fed watcher, and investment strategist who is widely followed by institutional investors. Yardeni founded his own global investment strategy and asset allocation firm, Yardeni Research, in 2007, having held top investment positions at several major firms. He is also the author of several books. The latest, In Praise of Profits, is dedicated to progressives to help them understand that profits isn't a four letter word. Another Yardeni book is Fed Watching for Fun and Profit, a primer for investors, which we discussed in depth in an earlier interview available on WealthTrack.com. In that book, he wrote, to do this job well, I've learned that nothing is more important than to anticipate the actions of the Federal Reserve System's Federal Open Market Committee, FOMC, which sets the course for monetary policy in the United States. Well, given the Fed's change of policy from easing to tightening, I asked your Denny if he was becoming less bullish. Well, I'm still bullish. I think uh, the stock market is still going to move higher along with earnings. Uh, but uh, what's really has changed is the valuation of those earnings. And we've seen that uh, since uh, early this year, that as investors have become more concerned about uh, the pace of uh, tightening and the about, about face, the pivot, if you will, from uh, easing to tightening, uh, we have seen a pretty significant correction in valuation multiples, but I don't think it's going to uh, uh, end uh, in tears. Uh, there might be some more downside here because the Fed uh, still has some tightening to, to actually get going in March and uh, the rest of the year. But once they do, I think the market's going to realize that uh, even if we get to 1% on the Fed funds rate by the end of the year, that's not exactly catastrophic. That's not the end of the world. And it's an environment where the economy continue to grow. I think it's a healthy sign. It's a sign that the Fed has confidence in the economy enough to, uh, to, to raise interest rates. So, no, I'm, I'm still bullish. It's interesting because in a, in a recent piece uh, from Yardeni Research, you, know, you wrote about Jeremy Grantham. Uh, he mm -hmm. was on Wealth Track saying we're in an epic bubble. He told us it was, the, mm -hmm. you know, it was even worse than the crash of 1929. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, he cited the fact that there were, there were four asset classes that were right. in extreme bubble territory, stocks, mm -hmm. bonds, commodities, and housing. So what about that thesis? Well, I think it's a very important thesis. Uh, Jeremy's uh, had some good calls, particularly in spotting bubbles uh, that burst. So he's, he certainly needs to be uh, listened to very carefully. And I've listened to him very carefully and concluded that uh, he's wrong. <laughs> Uh, or, or that um, I in, in, in which case? In, <laughs> or in the, which or the, bubble? Or, <laughs> or that I disagree? Well, look, uh, the, the stock market bubble, we have to start there because uh, that's really the heart of his argument is that there's all these bubbles around the bubble in the stock market and uh, it's going to burst and they're going to burst and it's going to be a calamity. Um, well, the stock market bubble has actually been letting a lot of air for the past year without any calamity whatsoever. Uh, you know, we've seen... Uh, air come out of the SPAC stocks. Right. We've seen air come out of the meme stocks. Uh, some of these stocks that the ARK Innovation Funds uh, owns, which are 
great companies in theory, on paper, they're, they're disruptive technologies, but a lot of them don't have earnings yet, they don't have revenues yet, so they're kind of on the come. They're, they're, they're promising to disrupt. And they had a huge run in 2020, mm -hmm. uh, up like 150%, and they corrected pretty substantially, in, in a bear market actually. So if we can take the air out of these bubbles without any side effects that are calamitous for the financial markets broadly, for the credit markets, or for the uh, economy, uh, I don't think it necessarily uh, uh, leads to uh, a, a real serious problem the way Jeremy thinks. Now, with regards to the bond bubble, um, I do agree that a bond yield under 2% in an environment where the inflation rate's running around 5%, uh, it, it's uh, kind of in the bubble territory, but there's something going on This is on the 10-year treasury you're talking yeah, about. The, yeah. yeah, the 10-year the ten treasury is under 2%. It's been there uh, since uh, 2021, uh, since last year. And it's been there despite the fact that inflation's gone up, despite the fact that bond investors know that the Fed's gonna be uh, raising interest rates. But maybe there's some gravitational pull between our bond yields and the bond yields in Germany and Japan, which are near zero. And that right. leads me to the conclusion that maybe there's some demographic factors, that the uh, aging populations, uh, more, more geriatric uh, societies uh, are prone to actually less inflation, disinflation, maybe even deflation, and it's also an environment where bond yields stay remarkably low. Uh, so that leads me to conclude that maybe inflation isn't gonna be that serious a problem for that long, and that we will see inflation coming down, and that um, I don't wanna f fight the, the, the bond market here and tell you that it's gonna go to three, four, five percent. I've been thinking it's gonna go to two, two and a half percent, but I've been thinking that for, uh, for about a year. I think it's gonna finally get there, but right. maybe that'll be about it. That's, that's not a real trouble for, for the economy. Housing, look, home prices are up 30% over the past two years. That's, you know, clearly seems like a bubble, but um, the big difference now from 2008, 2009 is we don't have these cr crazy uh, uh, credit derivatives that are yeah. backing up all these. If home prices fell 10, 20%, I don't think it would be a calamity for the economy the way it was back in 2008, 2009. I, I hope we don't actually go through that kind of experience, but there's so, so much fundamentally going on for housing. People want houses, they, mm -hmm. they want to live in them. Uh, and so I don't really see a bunch of speculators the way there was in 2008, 2009. Commodities, commodities are up because the global economy has recovered from a pandemic. So when I put it all together, I, I'm sorry, I just don't see a super bubble. Yep. So let me ask you about an, another aspect to the, the bond market. And, and, and when you and I talked um, earlier, you kind of said the bond market is really acting kind of weird. Um, <laughs> but, but what isn't weird about the Treasury market at any rate and the direction of interest rates right. is that, uh, that you know, we have more government debt than we've ever had in our history Correct. and as a percentage of GDP. And, um, and the, the interest to carry that debt Mm -hmm. is minuscule right now. And e even if the Fed raised rates a little bit, um, that's still a big number on mm -hmm. what the government is gonna owe in interest payments. Sure. So what about that aspect? Well, I, I think if there's gonna be a calamity here, it's going to be uh, rooted in the inflation. If inflation turns yeah. out not just to be persistent, but something like the 1970s all over again, that, that was so bad it was called the great inflation of the 1970s. So if we have the great inflation 2.0 in store for us, that's gonna be a disaster because then we'd have Volcker 2.0, which means that the Fed uh, under Powell uh, would have to raise interest rates to levels that cause a recession to bring inflation down. So the analysis of inflation is extremely important to get right because if, if inflation gets worse, uh, we're gonna have a 1970s style problem and we're gonna have a bear market along with a recession, but I just don't see it playing out that way because I think there's some powerful forces that'll bring inflation right back down. You mentioned uh, that, that we could be in trouble, that a recession could occur if in fact mm -hmm. we kind of had a replay of the right. Volcker era with Powell, but do you think in this day and age that Powell would ever <laughs> make the kind of tightening moves that a Paul Volcker did? So it's, it is a little hard to imagine. So. Uh, but look, uh, push comes to shove, and he, if that's what he's got to do, he'll have no choice but to do that. Uh, but I just don't see that playing out uh, that way at, at this time. Uh, the what you call the mega cap eight stocks, um, and you know those are the Netflix and the Amazons and the Googles yeah. and, and everything else. Now they've taken a hit as well. 
Um, they were, according to your research, 50% of the S&P 500 growth index growth. at one point. Yep. Yep. And, um, and so, you know, most in many investors at any rate own an S&P 500 index fund. Mm -hmm. And so they've taken a big hit if they look at their statements. Sure. If, uh, so what effect does that have? The mega cap eight are the eight largest uh, capitalization stocks in the S&P 500. Right. And uh, not only do they account for 50% of the S&P 500 growth index, uh, the other side of the, that is the value index, uh, but they ac accounted for 25% of the S&P 500 total market in cap, total. so one quarter. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, part of the reason they, uh, they have gone up so much is exactly for the reason you said, and that is, a lot of money went into S and P 500 ETFs, and that that's uh, passive. Uh, that's passively managed. It is right. what it is. It's not active management the way mutual funds are. There are a lot of mutual funds uh, and own these stocks, but there's a limit to how much they can own. Some of them are actually limited to owning no more than two to three percent of their portfolio in any individual stock. And money came out of those and went into ETFs, and I think that contributed to the uh, hype uh, the, in the uh, valuation multiples of the uh, big cap stocks. However, these are really great companies. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, they're very controversial, of course, and regulators out uh, to get them. But uh, for big companies, their ability to show earnings growth is phenomenal, and they have tremendous cash flow. So I really view this sell-off as an opportunity for those who have missed those stocks to get into some of them. Uh, and uh, those who've uh, taken a hit here, be patient. They'll, they'll, they'll come back, the market will come back. What's gonna drive the economy forward? Uh, you know, we just had a kind of a blowout fourth quarter GDP up, what, 6.9%? Yeah. Um, is that kind of the, the last big surge from the COVID recovery or you know, where do we go from here? What's going to drive the economy? Yeah, it's a very important question, Chris. Well, I, I think that is the last big surge from the pandemic. We, we've had some, uh, an extraordinary business cycle, right? In, in uh, 2020, we had a terrible recession that lasted officially all of two months. Right. And then we had an amazing recovery that within a little over a year got us right back to where we were before GDP uh, uh, peaked mm -hmm. uh, uh, prior to the pandemic. And now we're at all-time record highs. We're in the expansion phase. The recovery phase is behind us. And so I do think you're right. I think uh, we're not going to get these kind of 6% uh, plus growth rates uh, any anytime soon again. Uh, I think it's going to be something a little bit more normal, something like 25 to 3% this year and going into next year. But there's something very important here in terms of thinking about what's driving the economy. It's really hard to get the economy to dr be driven by the number of consumers simply because the number isn't growing anymore. The labor force, the population growth is about really close to zero. And that's structural. A lot of people have been looking at the labor market and says, what's wrong here? Why, why aren't we finding uh, more people looking for jobs? And the answer is they're really not there. Uh, mm -hmm. Baby boomers are retiring. They're basically barely being replaced by new entrants into the labor market. So I think that this tight labor market is, going, is forcing companies to spend a lot on technology to increase the productivity of workers. And that in turn means that wages can grow faster than prices. That's what's going to drive economic growth. Consumer spending is still going to be the driver, but it's going to be based on real wage gains, which is fabulous for yeah. all of us that uh, can enjoy that. It's, it's an increase in the standard of living. And by the way, it's also great for capital spending, particularly on technology, so that's a driver. Uh, and then, of course, the auto industry may be about to, not maybe about to, but it is going to be transformed uh, from uh, uh, gasoline to ele electric vehicles, autonomous vehicles. I mean, that's going to be a tremendous source of economic growth. What's the lag between, you know, the increase in capital spending when you actually mm -hmm. see the productivity, you know, pick up? Because, sure. of course, the transition yeah. can frequently be quite painful. Yeah. Productivity is a tough variable. First of all, right. uh, there's a lot of controversy, uh, uncertainty of whether we're actually measuring it correctly. Right. <laughs> my, what, what I tell people, if, if the data supports my story, it's good data. If it's not, it's going to be revised. <laughs> uh, good way actually, to operate, Ed. <laughs> that actually happened in the late 1990s. Uh, uh, I was taking the same position that Greenspan was taking 
Alan Greenspan was the Fed chair back then. Yes. And he said, there's something wrong here. The productivity numbers must be better than we're measuring. And sure enough, a couple of years later, they were revised up to show much stronger productivity. But I have no problems with the numbers that are being published now. It showed that um, on a five-year average basis, it's volatile data, so I have to average it. Right. And the five-year average also allows me to kind of look at, you know, how's it been doing for the past five years? It's not a day-to-day -day variable. It's something that affects us over time. And so uh, on a five-year average annual rate, we p bottomed at 0.5% at the end of 2015. That's pathetic. Uh, now, on that basis, we're up to almost 2%, and I think we're going up to 4 4 4.5%. And when I tell that to people, I say, that's nuts. That's no way that could happen. I show them the chart, and it's happened before. We've had previous productivity boom cycles, and typically it peaked around 4 4 4.5% on a five-year basis. So mm -hmm. that, that, that's, why I, I, that, that's why I'm kind of looking at the 2020s and thinking, well, it'll be the roaring 2020s. Uh, we had a technological boom in the 1920s. I think we're going to have a technology boom, lead boom, uh, in the 2020s. And I think it's already started. I think the capital spending has already been there, uh, sensing that there's a need to deal with uh, uh, a slower growth in productivity and, and a, a labor force that needs to be augmented in terms of their mental and uh, manual productivity. And that's what artificial intelligence does. That's what exoskeletons do. And so I think all these te technologies that are already there and are being used, I think the pandemic actually accelerated the pace at which these things are being incorporated. So I don't think it's going to be a very long lag. I think by the, in the next couple of years, we're going to see productivity grow faster and faster, and we'll see the benefit of that. So what are you recommending as far as uh, in investment strategy? And mm -hmm. uh, you know, let's start with the, the U.S. and the mega right. caps that we just talked about and small and mid cap stocks. There's uh, basically uh, three uh, investment styles that are implied by your, by your question. Uh, one is uh, uh, large caps versus mid caps, small and mid cap. Uh, right. And I like to look at the S&P 500, 400 and 600. Um, and the 600 are the small caps, 400 are the mid caps. And then uh, another investment style is uh, growth versus value. Right. Um, and then uh, stay home versus go global. In other words, do you want to mm -hmm. mostly have your investments in the U.S. and overweight the, the, the U.S.? doesn't say you don't go overseas. just means that you underweight the rest of the world. Or do you want to go global and, uh, and overweight the rest of the world? So to run through these uh, kind of quickly here, yes. first of all, all three of them have been greatly inf impacted by the mega cap stocks. Large caps and growth and stay home, those investment strategies have worked better than the other ones and the alternatives yep. because they're dominated by the, the mega cap. Well, now that the mega caps are underperforming, guess what? Uh, we're seeing that uh, large caps have gotten a hit. I think there's a tremendous opportunity in the SMID caps. They are really, really cheap. It's been really odd to see their prices actually going sideways for the past year while their earnings expectations just keep flying better even right. than the S&P 500. So their valuation multiples have crashed. Not their stock prices, their valuation multiples. I much prefer looking at sectors and industries. And when I so do, let's that, do that, mm -hmm. well, when I do that, I wind up uh, having a little bit of both uh, mm -hmm. or a lot of both. I have uh, energy. Why energy? Well, uh, climate activists have been very successful in uh, convincing uh, fossil fuel companies that they've got to cut back their capital spending on finding fossil fuel and extracting fossil fuel. So we're going to have less of it at the same time that the transition isn't going all that smoothly uh, to uh, clean energy. And so that's keeping prices up and, and, profits. Uh, and, and it's keeping their profits up. Uh -huh. Financials look great to me. Uh, they've had a great run. They've had a correction uh, early this year. Uh, but I think that their earnings are looking fine. The loan demand is coming back, which is a, a big, big deal, uh, especially as interest rates go up. The capital markets aren't as easy to uh, finance uh, debt. So mm -hmm. loan demand is coming back. M&A activity boomed last year, all-time record high. I think that continues to, to boom this year. And then these beat-up technology uh, names, I mean, they're not beat-ups. Makes makes them sound like uh, they're, they're poor, poor victims. Uh, they're not doing that badly, especially when you look at where, where they are relative to where they'd been a few years ago. Uh, but there are opportunities. There are plenty of uh, 
values. Uh, I mean, you know, some of the biggest hits were in uh, companies that have done well in, uh, in the cloud, in, uh, uh, providing cloud computing, mm -hmm. and uh, the semiconductors, but they, that's where the hits were. And uh, I think that's, uh, you're going to find those stocks making a comeback. And this is in the U.S. You're talking about U.S. companies yes. right now. Yes. Uh -huh. Now, in terms of uh, stay home versus go global, right. I'm, staying, I'm staying home. That doesn't mean I'm not telling you to, there aren't opportunities overseas. The rest of the world does look cheaper relative to the U.S., but the, take out the mega caps and, the, the, uh, and, you be, and take out growth and just look at value. The rest of the world really trades like the S&P 500 value stocks. That's really what's, uh -huh. what's been happening here. Uh, if you really want cheap, you can find ch cheap uh, overseas. But I'd rather do value here than uh, uh, go overseas. I think the and, U.S. And is, why? Wh wh well, why the, is that, Ed? The U.S. is extremely well diversified in terms of the of the kind of industries we have. Mm -hmm. We have world class companies in all of these. You know, you go overseas uh, uh, and you find that the indexes are very heavily uh, skewed towards uh, uh, banking and. Uh, energy, uh, financials and energy. So in other words, you wind up uh, investing in, uh, uh, in value. But I think you can do that here uh, yeah. without having the uncertainty, without having the, the, the currency risk. You know, we've seen the dollar extremely strong of late, and that's another sign that you want to stay home rather than go global. But how long can the dollar remain strong, again, given the, the, the debt overhang that we've got mm -hmm. in this country and the financing challenges ahead uh, for the Federal Reserve. You know, there's a, lo there's a lot of debtors around the world. And, uh, you know, the Europeans certainly have been uh, uh, borrowing a, gr a great deal. Um, if you go to China, you'll see that uh, their, just their bank loans have increased from $5 trillion in 2008 to $25 trillion oh now. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, it's wow. huge. And, w and we all huge. know that they've got, they've got a, a housing bubble that's, uh, I think, worse right. than the bubble uh, we, we had here in the United States. And there's a tremendous amount of debt that uh, is pretty flimsy. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, it's, all a, uh, it's all kind of uh, relative. I think uh, you know, we're in better shape. Look, I think we came out of the 2008 calamity uh, restructuring ourselves much better than uh, just about anybody else did. And so our banks are in great shape. Our capital markets are superb. I mean, they, 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 you can't compete anywhere with our uh, capital markets. And what's great about our capital markets is they're wide open to entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs with any cockamamie ID uh, are able to raise money. They can go on the internet and find some of these uh, crowdfunding uh, 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 applications that allow right. them I mean, to you, raise you money. Call, you call us the U.S. a shark tank economy. That's right. <laughs> so the yeah, entrepreneurial I, <laughs> capitalism, right? My wife and I love to watch that show and uh -huh. uh, it, it brings tears to my eyes. I mean, it's it's such you a know, beautiful- All these young entrepreneurs, <laughs> right. Yeah, it's, it's, I think that show's done amazing stuff in terms of making people understand how, how entrepreneurial capitalism really works, which, right. by the way, is a subject of my latest book, but we can get to that another yeah, time. Well, we will, we will in an extra feature <laughs> Thank for you. our website. Thanks for yeah. the opportunity. One investment for a long-term diversified portfolio, and what should we all own some of? I like the stock market still. I, you know, I'm maybe overstaying my welcome here. It's been bullish since 2009, and I, uh, I think that, as I said, uh, we're, we're getting some opportunities to buy some of the large caps. I think uh, we've we've got a lot of opportunity to buy some of the smaller mid cap stocks. So, uh, you put that together and you get the S&P 600, 400, and and 500. Put it together, you get the S&P 1500. So if you can buy an index like that or put together three indexes like that, uh, I think uh, over the next two three years you'll do fine, and longer term you'll do uh, just as fine. All right, Ed Yardani, always a pleasure to have you on Wells Track. Thanks so Thank much. Thank you. Thank you, Gonzalo. At the close of every wealth track, we try to give you one suggestion to help you build and protect your wealth over the long term. This week's action point is be aware of potential risks in popular ETFs. Now, ETFs have many advantages. They have low fees, they're more tax efficient and trade like stocks, but a few have recently revealed a flaw. They can get too big and unlike traditional mutual funds, they don't close to new investors. The more money pours in, the more shares they have to buy the more expensive those shares become. Case in point is the once wildly successful ARK Innovation Fund, which recently plummeted. As the intelligent investor columnist Jason Zweig wrote in the Wall Street Journal, 
The ARK Innovation ETF posted big returns and big money followed. Now it's the latest example of what happens when a fund becomes too large for its own good. Well, over the years, many hot mutual funds have also suffered from rapid growth and problems investing large sums of money, but well-managed ones have recognized their limitations and closed to new investors. But as Wide notes, ETFs generally don't close to new investors. The ability to issue shares continuously is what keeps the price of an ETF trading in line with the value of its holdings. It's always buyer beware when investing in a hot fund, but it turns out it is even more important in an ETF. Well, next week, our target is target date funds. Wyatt Lee, head of T. Rowe Price's gold-rated retirement fund series, runs us through the ins and the outs. In this week's extra feature, Ed Yardeni discusses his new book, In Praise of Profits. It's dedicated to progressives. We hope you will follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and our YouTube channel. Thanks for watching. Have a great weekend and make the week ahead a healthy, profitable, and productive one.